These videos are going to cover how you can start using Forma within 15 minutes. To get started, this is the site setup. So if you're doing a project in Northern Europe, there's some great contextual modeling data here. Here we can choose our location up to four square kilometers and we can order the data. A lot of the data has been set up by the team so you can pull this data down for free and you can start pulling it in for terrain modeling, for your roads, for your site parcels, your boundaries, and also your buildings. All of it comes in correctly geolocated with an aerial map to go over the terrain. Now, if you don't have site data, if you're based in the part of the world like I am in, in Sydney, in Australia, you're going to have OpenStreetMap data, which maybe isn't as good as some of the data you're going to see in Northern Europe. Here, when we bring in an OSM data model with the digital elevation data, it's going to be between 10 and 30 meters. So this is not quite like what Sydney Harbour should look like. We can replace it, though, with our own data. Here, we can import in OBJ or IFC data to align with our flat terrain part of the site. So the workflow I'm going to go through here is the new project setup. I'm going to pick my location, put it in my folder, give it a name. I'm going to choose the new standard type, which is the former application. Choose my location and then zoom out to within the four kilometer boundary. Here we have OpenStreetMap data. I just want the flat terrain uh, because that's going to form the base of my model. Now I can import in my OBJ file. And if it's come from a GIS provider, you can start to use the georeferencing tool here. So we have put in the map grid of Australia tools to locate it to the correct location. Now the OpenStreetMap data is showing the digital elevation model. We'll get rid of that in a second, but we can place in our OBJ model inside of the canvas space. And we've got some snapping tools to align that information accordingly to the flat terrain data. So that's how you can set up a model inside a former without having necessarily the local site context. Now from here, we want to look at setting up our site. So we've got some fantastic tools here, which allows you to accurately locate your site boundaries and then give them a name. We can then go and add zones within our sites as needed and give them a name as well. This comes in handy when you start to do the analysis. So it's a good idea to set this up properly and it will help when you want to set up constraints or other parts of the analysis. My constraints here, uh, it's a, a vertical box, but I can set it up and adjust it to the height I require. And then the next thing we want to do is set up a terrain pad. So we have two options here to work in a vertical environment or have a slope terrain pad. Here I want to bring it up to the elevation of my imported OBJ file. Next, I want to start to use some of the automated conceptual design tools. So this is the first part of the modeling process where we have a, a linear design building where we can align the corridors. We can start to drive the floor to floor heights. We can start to drive the total floors. You can go into the sketch design mode and then to start add other items like cores, corridors, uh, unit sizes, and you can start to adjust in 2D the 3D model simultaneously. There's a few settings here to adjust how you want it to display. So if I'm working for a developer, they're always wanting to know about areas. I can put a line, a sketch line between that sketch design. It does it in the model and it gives me the area feedback. Next, I want to use the basic building tool. So the next one in the modeling engineer, we can uh, drive the length and the width of that building. Here you can get a bit more creative. You can start to um, angle the building if you want to, shape it in certain ways, and it drives the floor to floor, it has the heights, and you can start to push and pull the width. So you can also convert it into a car parking building. So if you want to do a vertical stack car parking building right down here on the Sydney waterfront, you can do that. Uh, we can flick back to not being a car parking building and we can make it residential. And again, we can go to the floor plan and start to work up our sketch design. 
This is really simple to use. Uh, you can start to adjust the size of the grids. You can rotate the grid to align with certain angles. You can very quickly create cores, fire escape stairs on the end of the buildings, and then create corridors to, to join them up. As we're doing it, we can see the lengths and the widths of the items we're creating. We can hold down the shift key to collect all the other floors and then fill that information down. And here you can see I have all my residential units with the square meterage uh, available and it's reporting back here in the GFA and the GIA. So next here we have the 3D sketch. So this is based on our original format engine. Here we can go in and we can start sketching in a more fluid uh, design style. So if I want to use one of the more advanced sketching tools, we can do a swept profile along a line, along a curve. Here I'm just creating a face. I can go and use the sweep profile. I can select the face and then select the line that I want it to track across complete the command, and now I have my outdoor uh, landscape benches out the front of the building. With this tool, there's a lot of features to array, rotate, group, make unique. All these cool things can be done just like any other type of sketch design tool. You can use the sketch design inside a former to create uh, more sculptural objects. We can also set up different types of trees in our design. So there's a tree line and there's also uh, a patch of trees. With that tree line, we can adjust the spacing, the height, how we want it to align. When it goes off the site, it actually drops down to the lower level, so make sure it stays on the site. We can choose a area of trees. This is where it will uh, do like a random scatter of trees on that surface. So here we have the trees scattered. We can adjust the height, adjust the spacing. If you need to do various types of trees, you can create different zones of trees and adjust the heights to make them a bit more unique. Um, but with that, you, this will start to impact certain analysis features in the model. Moving into the analysis workflows, we have sun and daylight here. Now, what you can do is you can have it analyze the entire site context. So you can go big with these type of analysis tools if you include them in the analysis settings here. So what I'm going to do is do analysis for my sun and daylight using the rapid analysis tool. The sites I created at the beginning, I'm adding these to be calculated or included in the daylight and sunlight analysis. I can have them running simultaneously. It's leveraging the power of the cloud to do this for me. I can also set up time intervals here to maybe fine tune what time of the day we're gonna have direct light. And down the bottom here, it's measuring the amount of hours that each surface is gonna receive. Uh, next with daylight, we can look at the daylight potential that the faces of the building are gonna receive. We've got this inspector that will tell us how, many, how much percentage of daylight we're gonna get. We can fine tune it down to certain parts of the areas where we perhaps need to look at adjusting the geometry or adding more uh, openings in the building to receive more daylight. Uh, we have a compare tool. So once you've done a few designs and you run the analysis and you want to compare them side by side, you can load them here in the compare function of former. So here I have a simple mass modeling building and then something that's a little bit more advanced. It's like a, a, a wave theme we have here. We can go and inspect them side by side. So if we want to look at the sun hours, naturally um, at the undercroft here, we're not getting as much direct sunlight, but we can compare that to, to the standard box building. So this can be done with numerous analyses that we run inside of Forma. Uh, for wind, there's two features within wind. There is a rapid analysis tool, and the one that I'm showing on the screen here is the more detailed analysis. This one takes between one and three hours to run. It will calculate the vectors of the wind going around the site in the 3D space. It will look at the velocity of the wind, and you can inspect where that wind is going, and it will measure the meters per second of that wind speed. In the workflow here, we have the wind tool and we can include the sites we want or we can choose the custom circle 
to hover over certain parts of the site we want to do rapid analysis on. So the detailed analysis as shown here is one to three hours. We're just going to do rapid analysis and we're going to look at uh, what's comfortable with the building designs we have. So it's on a harbour, we have a, a tunnel between the two buildings and you can see it's starting to pick up a little bit quickly between those two buildings we've designed. So maybe it needs more consideration. We can also uh, let the detail analysis run in the background and we can switch to direction. We can crank up the velocity, we can adjust the wind direction and in real time, we have the pseudo color overlay, which is showing the meters per second of the wind going around the building. With microclimate, this takes into uh, fact the, the sun and the wind um, and the environment you're working in. So um, to get true accurates on this, true accurate analysis on this, you can measure the microclimate once the wind and the sun have finished doing the calculations. You can see here that we are doing this in January, which is the hotter period in the Southern Hemisphere. So you can see it's ranging up to 40 degrees Celsius. And when we look at the temperature between those buildings, it's 48 degrees. If we go to June, which is our winter, now you can see the range is changing and the temperature has, has dropped between the buildings. You'll also see certain uh, overlays there where it's a little bit cooler by the trees. So whatever you're doing within the modeling process, this affects the analysis process. Moving into energy usage, we have an operational energy tool. This is in beta, but it still has some great features to inform your building design. So we can look at operational energy, like how much energy the building is going to consume based on the material types we use. So if we make it all uninsulated, 100% glass, and it's single and it's clear glass, um, it's going to show up as this crimson color. There are some more advanced settings that haven't been completed yet, but you can see window shading and HVAC systems are coming. We can go and change the wall types, make the windows triple glazed, drop the size of the window ratios, maybe down to 40%. And now we can see that even in a, a very hot human environment, the uh, consumption of energy, the kilowatts per cubic meter, um, is dropping based on those materials we've selected. Moving into extensions. So when you go to look at the extension feature inside a former, you can download the MSI file for the Revit download. You can also start to test the new Rhino add-on in beta, and you can enable the Shape Diver and Test Fit tools. So if we look at uh, Shape Diver and Test Fit, we need to add them and hit the Agree tools. If you have access to Shape Diver extensions, you can add it there. If we look at the Test Fit parking, we're just going to do a small part of our site. This will enable us to work in a 2D environment to sketch out the car parks and then make adjustments to buffers, widths, uh, stalls, uh, etc. We can start to look at using the simple tools with Shape Diver to do a tower. So with this script, it's based on a Grasshopper script, it will drive a stack tower with some lower levels and some setbacks. As we make changes to it, it will drive that information. And we can then start to use the, the cooler design one, which is the twisted tower option. With the twisted tower option, we can choose a different shape, run the script, and it will uh, drive the building. We can change the rotation angle, the floor to floor height, and the floor count, run that script, and we get a result of a building like this. It does sit on the generic layer, so it is its own um, generic modeling environment. It's not tied to the basic modeling. But very quickly, you can generate forms using scripts with ShapeDiver. So finally here, we want to take the former design data, the analyzed data, into Revit. So with that MSI download, you can have that installed in Revit. What we're going to do is choose a design option. Then we're going to send that option to Revit. And then we're going to fetch that information in Revit and load it in with the data that can be used for developing it in your Revit documentation. 
So we have a, a basic building here. Note that the basic building data is going to be the one that's going to convert. If you've done sketch or shape diagram information, it will be a generic object in Revit, whereas the basic information converts into system families. Here, we're going to load in the data. You can choose if you want to merge adjacent walls, apply satellite image to the terrain information. This will load it in, depending on the size of the model, takes a certain time. There may be certain warnings here, but it gets the data through uh, we can turn off the constraints here and you'll see that we have the site information, the aerial imagery, and we have our building information here, which we can generate floor plans for, from. So I can go to those floor plans and it's created levels, it's created grids, I can create a section and generate that section and our building has been started on its uh, more detailed BIM journey. Here with one of my templates, I can uh, adjust that building, add my curtain walling systems, add my materials, and then generate that building design within the context that's come across from former. What I also really love about this is it sets up shared coordinates. If you've ever struggled with learning this, former is a great tool to actually set up the northings and eastings for you, import it into Revit, and that's done. Finally here, um, you can connect this out to Twinmotion. If you have a subscription of Revit, or ideally a collection to get former, you can use Twinmotion to do some quick renderings. Now this is what I call a basic animation. It does it super fast. You can light it with an HDR environment, and very quickly without even having to do ray tracing, get a result like this. We can set up numerous camera views here. We can adjust how we want the lighting to be reflected, add different types of settings to get this glare type of look. But here we have the former design intent model brought into Revit and then linked to Twinmotion to produce these type of results. We can also adjust the HDR lighting to make this look a little bit more impressive at sunset. And you can see I've added a rooftop pool. And the details of the materials and the extra items you can add to Twin Motion really help to make it pop. And we finish here with a sunset view. Uh, the plane is not flying, but we can still see the contextual data that's come across from former into Revit and then through finally to Twin Motion.